Please, good afternoon. Everyone's had their coffee. I guess ready to go. Um, I'm Mike Boggs. I'm a justice on the Georgia Supreme Court. I also co-chair Georgia's Criminal Justice Reform Council, and I've been asked to give you a kind of an overview, if you will, of what we've done in Georgia in the area of justice reinvestment, but also criminal justice reform. So, and I've been told I've got kind of multitask here. So, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. I want to leave some time for some questions. Um, this is very similar to the church I belong to, so all the back row Baptists are in the back, and uh, I understand how that works. So with that, um, let me talk to you a little bit about, before we get into what Georgia has done um, in the nature of criminal justice reform since 2011, I want to get into the, to the why, right, the impetus, the perspective about where Georgia was in 2011 when Governor Nathan Deal had been elected in 2010. Uh, you need to understand a couple of things, uh, if you will, going into this slide presentation. Our governor is a lawyer. His son is a superior court judge in Georgia, which is a, uh, a, a, a court of general jurisdiction that handles felony misdemeanor or felony cases, uh, r very rarely misdemeanors, and he ran a drug court program. I am a former tr uh, circuit court judge where I presided over six counties, uh, both felony cases on the criminal side but also civil cases. Uh, before I went to the Georgia Court of Appeals and, of course, before I went to the Supreme Court. In that capacity, I started an adult uh, felony post-adjudication drug court program. Um, and so I have a little bit of background in, in the accountability court arena. And then so then we get a governor elected in 2010, which you all remember. I'm not sure what Oregon's uh, fiscal climate was in 2010, but Georgia's was pretty bleak. And so we had, these, we had a Republican-controlled uh, executive branch, Republican-controlled House and Senate, I formerly served in the General Assembly of Georgia, and so we've, I have some great relationships there, but basically three things happened, maybe here too, in the 1990s that got Georgia uh, where you're about to see we were in 2011, and that is this. First, the General Assembly passed three strikes, you're out. So in Georgia, on your fourth felony conviction, the judge was required to give you the maximum sentence imposed in the statutory framework and it was non-parolable, non-suspendable, and non-probation uh, eligible, mandatory minimum, if you will. In addition, we instituted mandatory minimums, and in addition, during that tough on crime policies in the 1990s that a lot of states were going through, um, we abolished earned time credit so you could earn your way into prison, but you couldn't earn your way out. And so those three things really got a lot of folks elected to the General Assembly that I served in. Um, they're easy to fit on a bumper sticker, and it really worked really well, this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you do the crime, you do the time sort of philosophy. Uh, but then we had the fiscal crisis uh, beginning in 2006, 2007. So understand that all of that perfect storm, if you will, the right governor, a Republican legislature, enormous fiscal problems, and a, a significantly growing prison population gave us some statistics that I want to share with you before the first slide. So between 1990 and 2011, 1990 and 2011, Georgia's prison population more than doubled, and I was listening at lunch to the population in Oregon, 14,000, 15,000 people in prison here. Ours doubled to 56,000 inmates in Georgia. We have 10 million citizens in Georgia, but we had 56,000 inmates in Georgia's prison system in 2011, having doubled since 1990. From 2000 to 2011, Georgia's prison system grew by 35%. We had a $1.1 billion Department of Corrections budget with a recidivism rate, three-year reconviction of a felony rate of roughly 30 percent. We were releasing about 18,000 inmates a year. 6,000 were back within three years. These are numbers I'm sure that aren't surprising to you because a lot of states were experiencing these sort of failed, if you will, correction systems. In fact, in my rotary speeches, I say that the biggest misnomer in in the entire judicial system was the Department of Corrections because it was rarely correcting anything. It should have been called the Department of Punishment. And so we all started seeing these really unsustainable and unacceptable public safety returns on the heels of very enormous public safety investments. In addition, because of the growth in Georgia's prison population, in 2011, one in 70 Georgians was in prison. The national rate was 1 in 100. That gave Georgia the fourth largest incarceration rate in the nation. In addition, 1 in 15 Georgians in 2011 was on probation or parole. Combined, our correctional control rate, that is the number of adults 
on some form of correctional control, either in prison, on parole, on probation, or in a county jail, was 1 in 13. We led the nation in the number of offenders or a number of people on correctional control, and it was not something we were very proud of, but those numbers all put together and, so, and, and promoted by and published by the Pew Center on the States led to really this perfect storm of what could we do to be responsible in addressing criminal justice policies and not expose from the political perspective the Republicans that were controlling the House and the Senate in Georgia. We meet every year for 40 days. Our General Assembly is in session right now. And the big concern among my former colleagues in the General Assembly was not getting beat on the left, but getting outflanked on the right and being called soft on crime. And so you've all been dealing with that in the area of, ju of uh, justice reinvestment in, in Oregon, but it's not, it's not something that, that is just uh, alone special to you. It's uh, the same sort of political dynamic exists uh, everywhere. So what was growing that prison population? Was it violent crime or property crime? And the answer was no. In 2011, violent crime was down 21% in our state. Property crime was down 20%. So what was growing our prison population at such an enormous and alarming rate, unsustainable rate? And what we discovered was that drug like you, probably, drug and property offenders were largely comprising our, uh, the largest portion of the standing prison population in Georgia. In fact, in 2011, 60% of our standing population were property and drug offenders, 60%. In 2010 alone, we admitted 5,000 low-risk property and drug offenders to prison for the for who had no prior criminal history. 5,000 people to prison just in that year alone. So with that as the backdrop, we knew that Georgia's prison po population was going to grow through 2017 if we did nothing uh, by roughly 8 percent. It would have given us over 60,000 inmates in Georgia's prison system and it would have cost Georgia's taxpayers roughly $264 million. So that is somewhat of the backdrop, if you will, of all of the numbers that led Georgia to really tackle this, really co this concept that is now in vogue of criminal justice reform. And so these numbers that I've referred to, including that the average length of stay for these folks that was going to prison had tripled between 1990 and 2010. So not only were we putting low-risk property and drug offenders in prison, prison expecting that they, their behavior would be corrected by brick and mortar and, and programming, but we were keeping them there much longer than we had in the past. And so with that somewhat as a, as a backdrop, over the, the governor created the Governor's Criminal Justice Reform Council. I was an appointee at that point of the then Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. And I'm not sure what happened. I think most people are a lot smarter than me, apparently, because I'm the only person that's still on the council <laughs> since 2011. Everyone else has moved on to other things, but I've now co-chaired it. The governor got all the appointments in 2012, and our council is really a bipartisan, nonpartisan, collaborative group of different agencies and disciplines, from criminal defense bar to prosecutors to faith-based organizations to the judiciary uh, to private. We have private misdemeanor probation in Georgia to community service providers, uh, both for felony and, pro and parole supervision. So very diverse group of folks that were going to take a look at smart on crime policies and make recommendations to the General Assembly. That's really unique, right? Because in the normal public safety or, or, or public uh, policy arena, it's really rhetoric driven, it's partisan driven, it's, it's, it's very partisan, quite frankly, and we see that both in Congress and in your own state, I'm sure. Very rarely have we ever seen folks collaborate and come together on issues that can really work well. Uh, this was the one issue where we found real bipartisan support, and it's unique, but uh, we can talk about why, but I think you know that this really touches on a lot of things that conservatives are interested in and a lot of things that, that the left might be interested in. And ultimately, our first bill that we asked the General Assembly to pass, which I'll go through, passed a 236-member General Assembly, 236 members in the House and the Senate. We have a big state. 236 members of the General Assembly voted unanimously to support our first recommendation. And over, we're going into our sixth legislative session now. The bills that we've recommended this year got dropped yesterday. And I think in the entire six legislative sessions where we've passed substantial uh, legislation every year, I think we've only had three no votes ever, ever. And that included last year making drug offenders uh, food stamp eligible, which is pretty tough in a Republican-controlled state, who the year before had imposed but never implemented drug testing for welfare recipients, right? So 
just to give you a backdrop of kind of where we are in a conservative state like Georgia, with 159 counties in our state, 159 counties, 49 judicial circuits, which means 49 DAs, circuit public defenders. I was a former circuit court judge. We have 213 circuit court judges um, called superior court judges. Um, and so very, very, very big state, and it's hard, as you know, when you roll out criminal justice reform, which is very heavily dependent on service delivery, to do that in rural areas of Georgia and in the metropolitan areas of Georgia uh, when, the, when it's so difficult to do it financially. So that's a backdrop, give you a little perspective of where Georgia was when the governor created this council. This is what we've done in a, in a nutshell over the last five years. So we started with adult sentencing reform. The next year we actually rewrote the, the entire juvenile code in Georgia. Annie Casey Foundation came in and helped us with juvenile justice reform. The next year we did adult offender reentry, and if you can kind of see how all this dovetails together, and you've probably done it as well in Oregon, um, you know, you start with the pool of offenders in your prison population, then you go to what some folks would call the school to prison pipeline and the feeder system, if you will, and then you work on the back end about how we can better equip folks to get back into the community in a more meaningful way, and offender reentry is, is, really, is really challenging, and I'm sure you've all looked at it, but it's challenging because there are a myriad of, of issues that can affect the success of someone moving back to the community, uh, whether it's job readiness or whether it's mental health issues or unaddressed or substance abuse issues, finding wraparound services, finding temporary and supportive housing, all of that, which is very, very difficult in year three that we addressed. We do have private probation that manages 80% of Georgia's misdemeanor population in Georgia, Pi private for-profit probation. It's created, as you might imagine, its own litany of concerns and problems and lawsuits. Uh, we had to address a lot of that in year four. In year five last year, we addressed criminal records, um, limiting access to some criminal records, um, at least for employment and professional licensing purposes, and we addressed recidivist sentencing, this whole three strikes, you're out policy. And so that's kind of a nutshell of what we've done. Here are some of the substantive policy recommendations that we've made. I, uh, the time limits here do not afford me an opportunity to go through the, the entire breadth of what we've done. At the end of the slideshow, I have a slide on the resources. Every report that we've generated that encompasses all of our recommendations, and all, by the way, all of them have now been codified. We've not lost anything. Food stamps was the only thing we weren't able to pass a couple years in a row, but we finally got it last year. So this is only an outline of some of them. But there is a website in Georgia that I'll give you at the end that has every one of our reports available to you online if you want to take a look at what Georgia has done. So we went to a felony threshold for burglary, theft, and forgery. We had been at $500. Every state around us had, had kept up with times and cost of inflation. And so we raised the felony threshold for burglary, theft, and forgery from $500 to $1,500, which, of course, has its own consequential effect of moving more folks into the state system uh, for misdemeanors. Uh, we, have, we went to a weight-based sentencing for drug sentencing. In Georgia, more than an ounce of marijuana is a felony. Less than an ounce is a, is a misdemeanor. But we had no other weight-based felony, weight-based sentencing structure other than, if there are prosecutors in the room, you would appreciate that in Georgia, more than 28 grams uh, of cocaine was trafficking. But less than that, any amount, residue on a straw, carried 1 to 15 years in prison. And in 159 counties with disparate uh, public ex expectations of elected judges like we have in Georgia. You might imagine that there were different degrees of, of what judges believed was appropriate for the first possession of cocaine. So we went to a weight-based system. You'd be surprised to find that uh, despite the advent of commu computers, we were still mailing sentencing packages to the Department of Corrections. And in Georgia, if I sentenced someone to prison today, they would go sit in the county jail waiting for the Department of Corrections to get that paperwork and approve that sentencing package, and then they would come get that individual and move them out of the county jail and move them into the state prison system. Interestingly, if they don't come get them within 15 days, they have to pay the county, the state, has to pay the county a per diem. If any of you run county jails, you know that running a county jail is expensive. In Georgia, it costs roughly $45, $46 a day, assuming no significant mental health problems and medical problems. But the county, the state was only paying counties $21 a day. But it was cheaper for the state to leave them in the county. So we, were, we had a big backlog of folks in the county jail system, so we changed that and electronically submitted that. And I'll show you in a moment a slide that explains better than any how that's worked. 
We created the Department of Community Supervision. So in Georgia, parolees were supervised by a constitutional parole board. Pro probationers, felony probationers, were supervised by the Department of Probation Supervision within the Department of Correction. And juvenile offenders were supervised by the Department of Juvenile Justice. We've put all that now in one shop and have a better mousetrap really for delivering community supervision. We provided a mandatory minimum safety valve for judges and gave judges at least an opportunity to deviate from mandatory minimums in certain offenses with DA approval, uh, which you would think would not be that meaningful, but it has proven up that, that it's proven up pretty well to give judges permission in drug trafficking cases and certain sex offenses to deviate from the mandatory minimum imposed by statute. We created, in order to incentivize employers to hire people, a presumption of due care and treatment uh, in hiring, retaining, licensing, leasing, leasing or, or admitting to a school program. So in, in essence, some limited liability for employers. Hire these people as long as there's no correlative effect between what they did and what they might do to get in trouble with your business. For example, Home Depot might not want to hire someone with a sex offense at all, but if they do, they certainly don't probably want them delivering the, uh, washing machines to people's homes, right? You don't want to hire a, someone with a very lengthy uh, criminal history of DUIs to be your delivery driver. But as long as that doesn't exist, and you completed certain programming in prison, you could get out with a certificate that would create a presumption of due care that gives employers some protections. We provided for conditional driver's licenses. I'm sure you have these provisions in Oregon. We're an accountability court judge with the onerous obligations of an accountability court where people have to come to be drug screened regularly, um, have to come to classes regularly. We allow judges to give um, conditional driver's permits. This piece was really unusual, and I'll give you the hypothetical. So Susie is arrested for three of these, prior to the change in statute, three of these $500 forgery or theft by taking offenses. On her fourth offense, she commits an offense of possession with intent to distribute cocaine because she's got cocaine in small packets in her pocket, and the DA believes that's sufficient to convict her of distribution. Under Georgia's sentencing statute, I now, as a sentencing judge, or would have when I was a sentencing judge, would have had to give her the maximum, and the maximum was not suspendable, parolable, or, probation, or, or allowed for probation. The maximum for her as a recidivist was 10 to 40 or life. It was life. That person would get a life sentence under Georgia's statutory framework under our recidivist sentencing, and the judges had no discretion. Now, you can commit a murder in Georgia, and as long as it's not a death penalty case, you're eligible in year 30 to ask the parole board for, for eligibility for parole. This person was not at all eligible to ask, so we've changed that now. And based on risk and needs assessments institutionally, your behavior institutionally, what programs you've completed institutionally, um, and your prior criminal history, as long as it included no serious violent felonies, no sex offenses, no weapons, you could ask for parole eligibility. We had at least 36 people in Georgia's prison system that were basically serving sentences like the hypothetical that I just explained. We now mandate the use of evidence-based programs in all DOC facilities. So we have, as you might imagine, with 56,000 inmates, we have numerous facilities in Georgia, not just prisons, but we have residential substance abuse treatment programs with barbed wire guns and guards. We have probation detention centers for probation revocation cases with barbed wire guns and guards, but all of them are now required to provide evidence-based programming. We reclassified the Designated Felony Act, which originally was an act that was intended to, to criminalize certain very, very, very serious behavior among the juvenile population. And as you might imagine, it was, it was the types of offenses uh, like murder and rape and armed robbery and aggravated assault and aggravated sexual battery and child molestation. But over time, that designated felony act, because of politics and lobbying efforts, had morphed from six offenses to 28 offenses. So it ranged the gamut from murder to smash and grab robbery. And so ultimately, the problem with that is that the designated felony act, as originally intended, required on conviction of any designated felony offense, mandatory out-of-home placement for that juvenile for a minimum of one year. So we, sh we changed that substan substantially. Here are some of the things we did that required not legislation but executive or administrative action. And we're going to run out of time if I don't get quicker, so let me just kind of slide through these. Um, probation detention centers, we capped the length of stay there, but of course now required 
uh, evidence-based programming. We now require the automation of pre-sentence assessments. Um, we in, in, in implemented a pre-release center for, um, for folks getting out of prison. Most importantly, on reentry, we adopted a five-year reentry plan, um, which includes uh, transition plans, prison inreach for mental health services, how does it, housing coordinators embedded in all of our prisons and transition centers, job placement coordinators embedded in our transition centers so that we have jobs lined up before they get out. And we, we partnered with the Department of Technical and Adult Education such that some of the programming that the, the offender receives in Department of Correction facilities will now apply for course credit toward a certification program for our technical colleges, which is what the Department of Technical and Adult Education is. So they can actually get a certificate when they get out and become more employable. We created day reporting centers, which is, if you're not familiar with, is simply an, an opportunity to send folks to a place during the day. They go home at night, but a place during the day to get programming, substance abuse, and mental health counseling. Um, and that's worked very well. Created a pro probation options management system that allows judges I didn't do this um, for various reasons, but it does, it does allow judges to delegate some responsibilities with respect to adjudicating probation revocations, because a lot of times a probationer will get revoked on a technical, sit in the county jail for a month, waiting on a judge to get to that case. This expedites the resolution of those cases with the offender's permission, while also protecting their rights. It's often said you can tell what's in somebody's heart by looking at their checkbook, so I would tell you to look at Georgia's checkbook here. This is how much money we've put in new state appropriations, and I was told yesterday that that $65 million is now $80 million um, that we've put in back into uh, these programs. Most of it, a lot of it, went into strengthening and expanding accountability courts. I'll talk in a moment about our, ju our juvenile justice local incentive grant program, but we put $5 million there with a million of federal money. Um, we've created a charter school program in our prisons, so not only do the inmates now have the eligibility to get a GED, but they can get a high school diploma while in prison. And we've put three men in for reentry. There's Georgia's prison population when we started, 54,895 inmates in Georgia's prison system. This is HB 1176, the first bill that was passed. We worked on it in 11, presented it to the 2012 General Assembly, and it became effective in July of 2012, and you can see a fairly precipitous decline in the population over time. These are other bills that we've passed. That's the juvenile bill, um, and this is a couple of years ago bill. Um, we're, we're maintaining a pretty flat line here, and again, keep in mind, we were projected to grow by 8%. So this number would have gone up, and we've come down. So January population, I just got this. Uh, we're at 52,806 now compared to the 54,895, which might not seem significant, but at $18,000 a day per offender, or a year per offender, that's a big number. There's our prison population. Jails have likewise come down. When we started in March of 2011, that was our jail population. We had 41,000 people in county jails, some of them misdemeanors, some of them sentenced felony offenders that had not yet been picked up by the state system, and our jails overall were at 92% capacity. Over time, we've now gotten that down to, in January of this year, 72% capacity and 34,000 inmates. So we've dropped, what's that, 7,000 people um, over the last six years. So pretty big numbers on jail population. Here's who's going to prison in Georgia. Um, when we started criminal justice reform, you can see roughly in 2009, we were at our high point. We committed 21,655 people to prison that year alone. Um, you can see when we pass these bills kind of what's going on. We're maintaining, I think, a pretty good flat line here at 18,000 people a year. This is important, um, hence the star, right? So 2015 saw the lowest number of commitments to prison in Georgia since 2012. Now, I will be the first to tell you, and there's a study that the Urban Institute is doing on all of our policies now to find out the correlative effect, right, between what we've done and some of these numbers. I'm not saying everything that we've done has driven this. As you know, there are cycles in crime in Oregon just like there are in, in Georgia. Uh, some better policing some year, some less in others year. More serious prosecutions some year than in others. So everything we've done is not necessarily uh, a cause and effect here, but I do think it's interesting to see kind of when the bill's passed and kind of where we are. Importantly, on racial composition of our prison commitments, I want you to take a close look at this so you'll see that read, read this part first before you get in the numbers. So while overall prison admissions have dropped 15% between 09 and 16, 
commitments of African Americans overall dropped 25 percent during that period of time. Um, in 2015 alone, the number of African American men entering prison was, was down 24.3 percent from 2009. The number of African American women entering prison was down 37 percent since 2009, such that the number of African Americans entering the prison system last year, which is this number, 9,983 offenders, was the lowest number that had entered prison in Georgia since 1988. So that's a pretty significant accomplishment. And as you know, as I started this conversation with, we were focused on nonviolent, low-risk property and drug offenders. There's never been an effort in Georgia to address serious violent offenders. I don't think there will be. The idea was to save prison beds for the people that need them. In fact, our governor's comment when he makes this rotary speech is that our real, our real thought in 2011 was to decide who we're mad at and who we're scared of, right? That was the challenge. That was the challenge. The people that we were scared of, we needed to lock up. You have them in your state. I sent, I'm convinced that the people that I sent to prison as a trial court judge needed to go, and it saved probably lives, and it kept people in their, and children safe. But in the end of the day, we were sending a lot of low-risk nonviolent offenders to prison. Predominantly, a large portion of them were African American, and now, because of the appropriations for accountability courts and the juvenile work, we're diverting a lot of that population into what you all know are more effective evidence-based strategies that have been proven time and time again by objective validated studies to produce a better public safety result. We all know that folks getting out of prison in Georgia, 18,000 a year, 6,000 will be back within three years. We also know that that costs $18,000 a year. So it's a very poor public safety investment of taxpayer dollars. No business that you know of could survive with a 30% failure rate, right? If a third of the cars that Chrysler sold blew up, I don't think their business model would work very well, right? But a third of our product failed, at least in the eyes of our normal methodology in calculating recidivism. So the, the, the real goal was, is there a smarter way to do this? And so when the governor put our, our task force together, he said, I want your recommendations to do three things. Hold offenders accountable. Because people do generally believe, I think, that if you make a mistake, you ought to be held accountable. My parents felt that way, I know for a fact, right? But you also ought to make sure that you're not only holding offenders accountable, but you're improving public safety and you're saving taxpayer dollars. Those were the three things that we were looking at. And so it's had an enormous effect, I think, so far on the racial composition of our prison commitments from the time we started this, which was right in here, 2011, to where we are today. You can see the total commitments of African Americans has down from 09 to 16 is down 15 percent in Georgia. Just in the last couple of years it's down 2 percent compared to this number which is up and then the total which is down 5.4 percent. So we think that there is a correlative effect there. Recidivism rates you can see we were at a high like a lot of states in the mid 90s. We're down to 26 percent now. Um, going in the right direction with a three-year reconviction rate, and that's, re that's reconviction for a new felony offense. Our jail backlog, because we're electronically submitted sentencing packages and we're doing a better job of moving individuals out of the local jail where they're not getting any programming, to get them into the programming that is available now, evidence-based programming that is available now in the Department of Corrections has reduced the backlog in our county jails, which is a big deal. So that's what the count, state paid counties at $21 a day per inmate to house state inmates in county jails in 2011. This is what we paid last year. Y'all get those numbers? So we've saved $25 million simply by expediting moving those individuals out of your county jails and into the state system where we all know they're going to get better programming. So. We opened up the e-portal. Everybody's now on it since 2013, and you can see the significant drop in per diem that was paid to counties. Length of stay um, has, has changed in our PDC, so when I wanted to send someone to a probation detention center, you should understand these facilities are determinative sentences. So when I sent someone to a PDC, you serve day for day. So if I gave you a year to PDC, you're going to serve a year plus whatever credits you had sitting in the county jail, but you don't get out early. Because we've now capped it and we focused on evidence-based programming, of course, as you might imagine, the length of stay has changed and we're cleaning some folks out, which has helped us with our county jail population as well. And we do think because of the increased programming at PDCs 
that we're going to see better public safety outcomes. As you might imagine, when you start moving nonviolent offenders out of prison and you start with this conversation about who are you scared of and who are you mad at, and you put the ones you're scared of in prison, you would expect your prison population, standing population, to get more violent. That is exactly what has happened. Sixty-seven percent of our standing population now are violent offenders versus when we started were 63 percent. Thirty-three percent are nonviolent offenders. We're going in the right direction. This is exactly what we would expect to see. Um, which is save those hard beds for the people that need those hard beds and divert low-risk property offenders and drug offenders with risk and need scores that demonstrate you can help them into more effective strategies. So before I move to juvenile justice, let me tell you that the challenge in juvenile justice for any of you that deal in the juvenile justice arena, you know that the strategies that work for adults don't necessarily work for youth. And we've all struggled with what does work. And we've all looked at Washington State's uh, analysis about cost and benefit, about what works and what doesn't. And we all know that, I hope, hope we all know now, that one of the least effective strategies, although it would work for me, is a scared straight program. That sort of thing just doesn't seem to have uh, the same results that we get from cognitive interventions like functional family therapy or multisystemic therapy and those sorts of things that have been studied and proven to work. And despite how soft all of that feels, the challenge in Georgia with 159 counties was how do you deliver? How do you go to juvenile judges and say, juvenile judge, don't divert those youthful offenders into behind the wire, out of home placements. Instead, give them these evidence-based programs that work. And the first thing they say is, fine, give us the money to build the programs. And so what we did is we said, all right, we will put ten, uh, $6 million with a $1 million federal grant into a $7 million fiscal incentive grant program that you can apply for. And all we're asking you to do is divert 15% of your youth, just 15% in the first year, divert into a program that we're going to give you the money to build. It has to be an evidence-based program. We had 29 counties in Georgia that received the money. Many more applied. Just to give you a scope of who these are, these counties, those 29 counties uh, serve 70% of Georgia's at-risk youth. So big counties, big counties. And we told the juvenile judges, like Judge Teske, that one of you just mentioned to me and others, divert 15% into these programs and let's study that and see how it works. Well, I'm here to tell you that after eight months, we did a, a, the University of Georgia did a study, and they did not divert 15%. After the first eight months, they had diverted 62% of the youth in those programs. They found this program extraordinarily successful, and they, they diverted 989 youth. So these are 59 counties with 29 courts, I think I said counties, serving 70% of Georgia's at-risk youth. And so we were very pleased with a 62% reduction over the first eight months, but now we've done a two-year study, and after two years we're still at a 54% reduction. So that equ it equates to about 1,122 youth in Georgia that have been diverted out of out-of-home placements, which, as you know, produce a very bad public safety return on your investment, into more effective strategies. To give you an example, prison cost in Georgia $18,000 a year with a 30% failure rate. One out-of-home placement bed in Georgia for a youth. Any guess on what it cost? 20000 Twice that, 36000 Any other ideas? One bed out-of-home placement in Georgia for a youth per year is $90,000. $90,000. Anyone want to guess what the recidivism rate is for that youth coming out of that bed? You all know. It's not 30%, right, like it is with adults. Any ideas? Up to 65% in Georgia. So again, this formula about diverting your money into things that work and taking money away from things that we know through decades and decades and decades of, 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 of doing them don't work. You know, I, I, I will tell you that I'm from a rural part of the state in South Georgia. I live near the coast of Georgia near Florida, but I work in Atlanta at the Supreme Court. And I will tell you that, you know, community values are different all across the United States and even within states, right? Eastern Oregon versus Western Oregon, right? Am I right? I don't know. You told me that, right? Okay. So... So, you know, we've got elected judges, and, and, you know, judges are a reflection of what the community expects out of those judges with respect to sentencing in particular. Having been one of those judges, I can appreciate this.
But, you know, it's really interesting to me when we say, well, why has the, sta- the United States, the Obama administration, the Justice Department, and all st- states like Texas and North Carolina that have all done this, what's, what got everybody on board? And I'll tell you that one of the things that I've, I've really kind of come to the conclusion of is that, you know, drugs, which we know in Georgia drive 80%, 80% of our felony criminal caseload is drug-related. And you can read the police roundup in my local community paper and read a possession with intent to distribute and know that's a drug case. Less intuitive and known to the public are the property crimes and the burglaries and the armed robberies and the forgeries and the financial transaction card frauds, right? They're all drug cases too. And they're all driven by this usage of drugs. And so now that we know more than we used to know, look, if locking people up changed people's behavior, we would put an entire industry out of business, right? It doesn't work. So I would speak to some group, and everybody's all for locking folks up, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But now the opioid epidemic is everywhere. Drugs aren't just over there and over there. They're in your own backyard. Rich kids, poor kids, right? All socioeconomics and demographics of your communities are affected by drugs. And it's real interesting now. Um, when I give these same speeches to conservative groups or liberal groups, and I say, you know, it's interesting, everyone wants to lock folks up for making a mistake with a drug offense. And I did, as a trial judge. I mean, I'm pretty hard on crime. My dad was an ATF agent. My brother is a DEA agent. I grew up in a law enforcement environment. Um, But everybody's real interested in locking folks up until it's their kid. And now it's their kid. And so we've gotten quite a bit of momentum around this kind of concept of maybe there's a better way and you know you can appeal to conservatives with the fiscal concept you can appeal to the left with a with a moral concept but in the middle we meet about well look let's forget the partisanship for a moment are there strategies that work and we know these cognitive behavior programs work and so that's why accountability courts have propped up that's why these sorts of programs fiscal incentive grant programs work so well so that's what we did in the juvenile arena You can see that our secure and non-secure residential populations have dropped substantially since we started all of this. This doesn't even go back, but that's calendar year 2012 through calendar year 2015. And you've seen in our residential youth development campuses and our youth development campuses, which are out-of-home placements, red and green lines, you've seen a little bit of downtick in some of that. So we're moving a lot of offenders out of those costly out-of-home placements. In addition, and I'm going to try to wrap up quickly, some other things that we've done, because you all have probably dealt with criminal records and you recognize the collateral consequences of a a record and how it might affect someone's employability. In Georgia, we have a First Offender Act, and as its name implies, it simply allows somebody to make a mistake. The judge can can sentence someone under the First Offender Act for most offenses, not all, uh, that are eligible. And if the offender completes satisfactorily all of the terms and conditions of that probated sentence, when they get through, they have no adjudication. They're not a convicted felon. It's a good program, but we had some problems. Um, Number one, they weren't being terminated and the criminal records weren't correct. So when I'm sitting on the bench sentencing someone and they say, well, I pled under the First Offender Act in in North Georgia, right? It's not my county. I can't go pull the file. And there's no disposition on on what you would refer to as a rap sheet, what we call the Georgia GCIC, Crime Information Center Report. There's no disposition. And that's because either the DA or the clerk never got it back to the judge to sign or they got it back to the judge and the judge never signed it because squeaky wheel gets the grease. They're not dealing with Susie because she's not causing a problem. So we said you get discharged by operation of law now. GCIC, the Georgia Crime Information Center, if Susie went to Oregon and picked up a misdemeanor marijuana possession out here and it showed up on her GCIC eventually and it would, the Crime Information Center housed at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation would automatically take away her first offender status and impose an adjudication with no judicial oversight. We've changed that. Um, We have now made uh, possession of alcohol by a minor as an eligible first offender plea. It never got added, and we have a lot of universities in Georgia. Our college students like to drink. I don't know about in Oregon, but they enjoy that. Um, We've made some that are not eligible, right? So if you're charged with human trafficking, abuse of the elderly, and abuse of the disabled, you can't plea under the First Offender Act. So it's worked both ways um, to get bipartisan support. In the misdemeanor arena, it would be hard to go through all of this, but just we had a couple of lawsuits that challenged uh, misdemeanor probation, for-profit probation in Georgia. Um, We've made some recommendations that have now been codified. 
Um, we, we mandate a conversion of fine to community service, and you, you think, well, why do you have to do that, right? Bearden versus United States, a Georgia case, says that judges, before imposing a sentence, have to determine the ability of the offender to pay, right? Um, it's not getting done all the time, and so we've mandated this, uh, that you can convert because they said there was no express authority to convert. We've established a presumption of indigency and say judges should convert to community su uh, service if the individual is presumed indigent, and there are only four things that would allow you to be presumed indigent. indigent. You either meet the definition under Title 17, our criminal code, of an indigent, or, which is 100% of the poverty guideline, I believe, or less, or you're totally and permanently disabled, um, or you have been in prison within the last year and you spent more than a year in prison. All of that, for example, would allow you to become indigent for purposes of imposing a sentence. You all know what tolling is. In tolling, um, Georgia's misdemeanor statutes did not permit a judge to toll a, a sentence for an absconded misdemeanor. So Susie could get a moving violation in misdemeanor court and get fined and leave and go to Oregon and wouldn't report and wouldn't pay, right? You couldn't toll the sentence in Georgia because there was no express statutory authority for that. There was a lawsuit in my court before I got on the Supreme Court wherein our court held that the inherent power of the court does not authorize the court to impose a tolling order. So now we do, under certain circumstances, allow tolling. But it takes into consideration due process concerns. Um, this is the case, Anderson versus Sentinel, if you want to see it in the Georgia Supreme Court. I, I didn't put the site there, but it's easy enough to find. Had a lot of people going on probation, and the only reason they were on probation was to pay the fine. I don't know if that happens here, but a lot of folks would show up in front of a judge and say, I don't have the $300 to pay the speeding ticket today. And the judge would say, well, I'll do you a favor. Um, I'll just put you on probation and give you 12 months to pay which is real good, except that that carries $35 a month supervision fee, a, a, a Fourth Amendment waiver, a lower standard of proof if you get in trouble during the process. And so ultimately, we created a status called pay-only probation where Sentinel or any other provider cannot charge more than three months of a supervision fee, but you have 12 months to pay. Now, we're going to try to fix that because this is all a Band-Aid on a larger problem. I'm sure you're all familiar because geography is wonderful. You all are out here near, near Utah. Utah last year took 200 offenses off their, their, their traffic code and made them civil infractions. And we're looking at doing something similar with our motor vehicle code as well. Non-moving violations, of course, you know who's going to scream. The counties and the cities that have been getting the money because they're going to say if it's not a criminal infraction and you can't put somebody in jail to exact these sums out of them, we're going to lose a lot of revenue, which I think begs the question, right? So pay only probation. Um, modified revocation process, uh, you cannot pre-arrest anyone. You can't bring a warrant to a misdemeanor judge in Georgia for somebody's failure to pay and have them locked up pending a hearing. You could before, and they might sit for three or four weeks waiting on a judge to get to them. Um, very antiquated process, so you can't do that anymore. Um, I don't have time to discuss that one. We've addressed school discipline, and I know you all look at that as well. There's a really, really hard time dealing with this issue in Georgia, but we've mandated the, the, the requirement that security, school resource officers is what we call them in Georgia, that if school systems employ them, they have to use a, a memorandum of understanding that delineates the obligations, right? You don't want a school resource officer being a teacher. My wife is a public school teacher. They have certain duties, but the school resource officer ought to be in the business of dealing with criminal conduct and not dealing with disciplinary conduct. Because oftentimes that disciplinary conduct gets put into the juvenile court system and then we end up with a feeder system. So we've dealt with some of that. I told you about uh, parole eligibility under the recidivist sentencing statute. We've created two additional accountability courts, family dependency treatment courts and operating under the influence courts, also known as DUI courts. Um, there's the limited driving permits. We've gone into our professional licensing statute. Um, some professional licenses in Georgia, like barbers and cosmetology and welding, um, were being denied based on people's criminal history. Um, we've made it uh, a little clear to our professional licensing division of the Secretary of State's office that there needs to be some other basis for the denial than just doing that. And then down here, as you know, years ago, federal government imposed a ban on receipt of food stamps for anyone convicted of a drug offense, but states could opt out. Georgia had never opted out, and so last year we were able to pass this. The vote in a 180-member House of Representatives 
with a speaker that's a Republican and a large majority, I think a constitutional majority, of the members who are Republicans, that issue passed with a vote of 163 to 1. So I say that because I, 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 I want to impress upon you, how, and you know this, but how important the bipartisan nature of all this is. So there's the money we've saved, basically. There's the $25 million in jail backlog per diems. Prison commitments are down, so we've saved all of this 4,100 people being committed to prison that we were expecting. We've increased accountability court capacity, and in the end of the day, uh, but for these changes, we would have added cost of roughly $76 million in Georgia. Now that's, for the leg any legislators in the room or county commissioners and understand this concept of cost savings and cost avoidance are two different things, simply by averting an 8% prison population growth in Georgia which was projected to be there by today, 2017, we saved $264 million, right? I say saved because we would have spent it, but we didn't spend it, and it was averted. Um, and so in the end of the day, we spent, we've, we've saved quite a bit of money um, through that. Some of the additional things we're looking at, and we're almost finished, but this is what we're looking at this year. I want to look at mandatory and non-parole eligible recidivist sentencing, and we couldn't get quite as far as I wanted this year with this. I mean, as a former trial judge, someone that was elected and been elected multiple times uh, statewide and in a district, I, I, I hope you would agree that people ought, that are elected ought to be able to, to do their job and not have their hands tied. And there's nothing worse than a judge um, who wants to make the, the sentence fit the crime who can't. And every judge I know has some anecdotal story, um, and I'm not suggesting that the judge ought to be able to deviate from what the citizen elected legislature said is the, is the range of 1 to 15. But I am saying on armed robbery, for example, if you're a party to a crime, in Georgia there's an offense called party to a crime, uh, or at least you can be indicted as a party to a crime. And if you're not the getaway driver, I mean if you're the getaway driver and you never had a gun, you don't have a criminal history, you've never committed any offense, you're in high school, um, you, turn, you called the police and turned in the two people that committed the armed robbery, you testified against both of them, but if you go, you can be charged. And fortunately, the people that committed the armed robbery didn't kill somebody when they went in the house and held the guy up because he'd have been charged with murder. But this guy, the, the story I'm giving you is a real case. Um, he rolled the dice and went to trial and was convicted because that's the law in Georgia that if you are a party to a crime and it can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you can be convicted. Well, I had to give him 10 years in prison, and that 10 years in prison is non-parole eligible, mandatory to the door 10 years for a high school honor student, and I don't, I don't make up for it, but I do say you ought to get, and he should have been held accountable, but maybe something less than a 10-year prison sentence, which is what um, some of the others get. So wanted to look at mandatory minimums. It's very difficult. The seven deadly sins in Georgia, which is uh, the very hard offenses, uh, it's going to be hard to, to make any inroads. Here's the big problem. Um, we have that many people on probation in Georgia. You see this number? 4, 471,000 people on some form of community supervision. Y'all got that many, right? Close to it. Anybody know how many organs got? I didn't look, but I'm guessing it's not that many. The national, the national average. Yeah, I'm with you. The national average. National average of per 100,000 adults in a state is that 1,500 people are on some form of community supervision. 1,500 people per 100,000 adults. In Georgia, we're 6,161 per 100,000 adults. We lead the nation in the number of people on probation. And, and, not here, but accurate, our probation terms are longer than anywhere else in the United States. A lot of reasons for that, but we put people on probation for a long time. And while they're on probation, as you know, the likelihood of recidivism is greatest during the first 18 to 24 months on probation. So this year, a lot of remedies that we're coming forward with, they're going to front load evidence-based programming on the front end and give them an opportunity to petition to be terminated or have the new Department of Community Supervision petition to have them terminated. We're creating with the Council of State Governments. You heard from Marshall Clement at lunch. I serve on the Justice Center Board of Directors. Um, great organization that's providing technical assistance to us and under their leadership we're creating a behavior incentive date too so that we're incentivizing people that if you will behave and you will take advantage of the programming that is available to you we will give you an opportunity to get this hook out of you and so ultimately 
that's kind of the problem that we're facing this year, and you'll see some recommendations on that. Here are, this is some of the places you can find some information, particularly uh, concerning Georgia. So our council reports are all located at the Department of Community Supervision website, and that's how to get to them. Um, it's a drop-down menu, um, and go to links and see related files, and that's where the PDFs are. The Pew Center on the States has, issued, uh, brief, has done issue briefs covering our 2012 sessions. Um, those are found at pewtrust.org. We created a misdemeanor probation bench card um, just last year that provides some very good, solid constitutional and statutory guidance to our misdemeanor judges in Georgia, um, not only about indigency, but about contempt and about other very important matters um, involving a lot of the changes that we've made. That card can be located at georgiacourts.org. Um, I serve um, on a national task force on fines, fees, um, post-Ferguson. That, that task force is uh, put together by the National Council of State Courts, and they just issued a bench card as well. So you can find several of these, but we found that this tool has been very helpful to educate our judges on some of the things that they ought to be paying attention to on revocations in particular. So with that, that's kind of what we've, why and what we've done in Georgia. We've got a few minutes left, I think, for questions, if anyone has any particular to, uh, to the presentation or otherwise, but thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. Right. It's an average, and I mean, obviously there are, there are instances in HIV cases or otherwise where there are enormous medical expenses that run the numbers up, but that's the average. Yeah. I, I think I saw that during the presentation at lunch or otherwise. Yeah. Our jails are roughly $46 a day on average, and the state only pays 21 but it's not paying much of that anymore. But yeah, I, I, we you know, it's... Economies of scale, right? We we have a lot of people in prison. Yes, sir. How did you get this collaboration drawn up? Just take us through this. You know, that's the question that always gets asked. I was I've been at the Justice Department on numerous occasions over the last several years as the Obama administration tried to do some of this with the Smart Sentencing Act that was pending in Congress. And um, Sally Yates, who you all probably know and have read about, is a friend of mine and was U.S. Attorney in the Northern District and was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General invited me up, and we've had these conversations, and they always say, well, how do you do it? And, and you know, I'm not sure, right? But I, I started off with the perfect storm. It took the fiscal problem to get conservatives on board. It took a lawyer, judge. Our, I did not mention this, but the governor was also formerly a juvenile court judge. He gets it and understood it. His son ran an adult felony accountability court. Um, we didn't have any money. Um, we've got a constitutional amendment to have a balanced budget so we can't operate in a deficit every year. So it was the perfect storm to bring people together. We have a very strong judiciary in the state, um, as you might imagine, with a number of judges, but there are only nine justices on the Supreme Court. Um, but I think having the judiciary involved um, and leading the way was very important in getting the buy-in from a lot of lawyer legislators um, to understand that this was not about being soft on crime. And we had to say it routinely, it was about being smart on crime. And so what we did that first year, when everybody was walking around on eggshells and being scared to death, the Republicans in particular, that they were going to get primaried, right? They were going to get beaten in the primary by being labeled soft on crime. We followed all of the primary elections that year. And you'd get a kick out of this, I hope, that it only, criminal justice reform only came up one time, right? One time. And in that instance, the person that was to the right of this Republican, and I know the Republican, and I'm not sure I knew there was any room to the right of this Republican, must have been standing on a ledge, but nonetheless, this person said he's taken too much credit for it, right? So it was really for Georgia, it was the right time with the right leadership. Um, we had enormous buy-in. Um, I think, and, and I think it goes back to a lot of the legislators had constituents um, that were experiencing this problem in their families. And it became, uh, became more, more well-known and more acceptable. Um, there was a time in the 90s when a lot of people just thought, and there are still people that think locking people up fixes the problem. I run into them every day. Sheriffs that still think the problem with their entire criminal justice system is it's not hard enough. So that was the challenge. Very good, very good point. A lot of sons and daughters, and 
you know, drugs know no, no, no boundaries, right? I mean, they're everywhere. And so one of the, you know, it, it's hard to say that anything good can come out of, uh, out of the pill epidemic, but, you know, it's, it's my understanding that the number one gateway in, uh, drug in the United States for decades was marijuana, right? Um, and now it's not marijuana anymore. It's pills. They're more readily accessible. There's less of a stigma associated with it. You can get them out of the medicine cabinet at your own home. And I had drug court participants that were using 30 Laura sets a day. 30. Um, and in the end of the day, I just think the pervasive nature of that helped us do this. But now it's also causing a heroin problem. Yes, sir. So I, if you add some stats by your increasing, increasing reduction in the black population, yeah. prison, yes, sir. but overall, you know, Oregon's looking at its uh, red issues and the RRI relative rate. How does Georgia figure out on those numbers? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Um, we don't know that there's any one strategy that we've employed that we did not start off with a strategy employed to reduce the racial composition of Georgia's prison system, although we knew that what we were going to do because of the disproportionate number of African Americans in our prison system, that we were going to have an effect. 66% um, of our standing population in 2007, um, 2011 were African Americans which is a disproportional population compared to the population of African Americans in Georgia in general, to the extent there's, that that methodology works. The number's now 63%. So we're going in the right direction. You know, I think we have to recognize that a lot of those offenders that are going to prison were low-level, low-risk, nonviolent property and drug offenders. And to the extent we're putting them in prison, we're now starting to get a buy-in from a lot of folks that there's probably a better strategy. And you all know this, but you get a better public safety outcome anyway on probation than you do coming out of prison. Probation is still a better alternative. I will tell you, as a former trial judge, I, I don't have a lot of faith in probation. It's not that I don't trust the people, and I don't trust, but I don't trust the process. It, it doesn't work very well to hold people accountable. A smaller scale, better numbers, APPA-type numbers would help. And so the idea here is to, if we can get Title 40 amended and get people off misdemeanor probation and limit the number of people we actually have on probation, we thereby, with the resources we have, increase the ratios, and I think we get a better result. But you can't manage 300 offenders in a successful way, in my opinion, and that's why we, you know, I spent half of my time doing probation revocation cases. Um, other questions? Um, anything else? Thank you all for your attention. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you. <laughs>